Welcome to 5 and 5 from the One Stop Co-op Shop, where we discuss five key elements of a game in about five minutes. I'm Michael Kelly, and today we're looking at Pendragon, The Fall of Roman Britain from GMT. Quick disclaimer that I was sent a review copy of this game. Pendragon is another game in the coin series modeling counterinsurgencies throughout history, like Cuba Libre that I covered earlier this year. But in this case, the game focuses on Britain, back when the Roman Empire still ruled there, and when Saxons and Scotty Barbarians are coming to invade and gain their own foothold in the country. While Cuba Libre is consistently called the most accessible game in the coin series, Pendragon is a much meatier entry. So did I enjoy the extra complexity? Let's find out and get to the list. We're starting with a mix at number 5, and that's the combat system that's used to resolve both field battles and stronghold sieges in the game. On the positive side, I like the fine line that combat walks between determinism and randomness. Generally, the only randomness is one or two die rolls to see if one side ambushes the other and gets to attack earlier. The rest of combat is really controlled and allows you to math out exactly how many units you need to defeat exactly how many enemies and take over the stronghold. But that's also where the negative of combat comes in because it feels too overly complex and sort of makes, at least for me, the math a chore to get through. They have a one-page chart that summarizes the whole process, but honestly it feels like a little bit more nuanced than I think I needed. Next we have a full-on con somewhat related to combat, although focused more on other elements of the game and that's the potential power of randomness. Most actions in the game are very controlled and set and deterministic, so the ones that are outliers really stand out. The biggest offenders, at least for me, are the two main barbarian actions, which are raiding into spaces and then returning those raiders with their plunder. In both cases, the difference between a really good roll and a really bad roll can be immense. Now, don't get me wrong, the game gives you lots of levers and actions to try to deal with some bad luck, and you make a lot of these rolls over the course of a game, so the luck tends to balance out. But if you're really randomness averse, this might bother you. But we get into a big pro at number three, and that's the way the game models shifting allegiances and history in the country over the course of the game. First, one of the game's coolest features is how the two British factions opposing the Barbarians are allied in a way, but at the same time both want to one-up each other and have the potential to totally fragment later in the game and become full-on opponents. But even more than that, I love the way this game feels like it's modeling a hundred years of history and how the entire landscape of the country is changing, prosperity is destroyed, entire parts of the country are abandoned, Barbarians get footholds and can't be knocked out. It really feels like you're living and creating history and it can be really exciting. But we're back to a mix with number two, one that could be super important for you if you're planning to play this solo, and that's how the AI is run. On the positive side, I'll give the AI credit for being generally really intelligent and using both the event cards and their available actions in smart ways. I also like how for the AI they added a small amount of dice rolling that will send them down different paths on their flowchart. But that being said, the AI is even more complicated here, even tougher to run, and it can be really slow going to work through those flowcharts, especially the first few times you play. On top of that, the priorities and the edge cases aren't as clear in the rules, even with both a rule book and a playbook as I would like. And I also felt like overall the British faction AI was a little bit dumber and also harder to run than the Barbarian AI, which does mean I recommend focusing on playing the Britons if you get the game. But we're going to end with a full-on pro for the game, basically the same pro I had for Cuba Libre, and that's the core system in coin games, which is the event cards. The core action in Pendragon is driven by these event cards where two of the four factions will have the chance to either do a major event or execute one of their actions. And man, is this system delicious. Even better than Cuba Libre because the AI is more dynamic in how they make their choices. Figuring out when you need to do an event, when you need to do an action, when you need to do a lesser action because, oh my god, the event is so terrible, you can't let your opponents do it. Add on that you can always see one event card ahead so you're not not just thinking about this turn, but you're thinking about what you're denying or allowing other factions in the next turn, it is just amazing. 
Overall, whether I recommend Pendragon for you is going to depend on a lot of factors. Even in its shortest scenario, playing Pendragon solo can take quite a while, two or three or even four hours when you're just starting out. Setting up the game, figuring out which little pieces go in which spaces can feel like a chore, and running the AI, figuring out exactly what they're going to do, it's always going to be difficult. There's no way around it. But that being said, I found myself enthralled with the game. It was all I could play or often think about for about four days straight. I love the scope of the game, the feeling of creating history, the vast differences between the factions. I love, love those event cards and how much variety they can bring from play to play as you see completely new ones. So if you're interested in this time period, if the complexity doesn't scare you off and you're ready for something really meaty, then Pendragon might be a complete hit for you. Good gaming and I'll see you at the next stop. Thank <laughs> you.